For the doctrine of Scripture, can we trust the Word of God in an age of suspicion? And when we consider the doctrine of Scripture, I think you need to understand, as you might use a Latin phrase for this, the sine qua non of the Christian faith. It's the sine qua non. It's without which there is no faith. It's the substance and the content of our faith in this reality that we believe wholeheartedly in the Word of God. Luther um, asks, or connected to Luther, we have this question, is your conscience held captive by the Word of God? This is Martin Luther testifying in Wittenberg um, about the truth of the Word, and he says, my conscience is held captive to the Word of God. And I want you in particular to, to note that he says the Word of God, not the Word of men. That when we talk about the Word of God, we're actually talking about the Word that belongs to God that has come to us men and women. Now I want to begin with two stories. The first story first story begins with this question. Where does the truth end and the lie begins? I had another back, backdrop, that's why I was puzzled by this picture. Where does the truth end and the lie begin? You know, it, when it comes to the Word of God, there's, there's, it's a constant battle. But I, I, I men, mentioned, I men, sorry, I remember meeting a pastor in, um, in Papua New Guinea. He was a Reformed pastor from New Zealand. And I knew that he grew up as an atheist, a very strong atheist. And I asked him, how is it that you became a Christian? And ultimately we say, well, it's the work of the Holy Spirit. But he said this, he was invited, he was, him and his wife moved to south, on the, south, the South Island, and he was invited to a, to a service, and I want to encourage you to continue to invite your neighbors to a service, because you don't know what God's going to do in that service. He was invited to a Christian service, and he noticed that the preacher preached with great conviction on the Word of God. For all his life, he thought this was a myth. So when he heard this preacher preach with such great conviction, and then after the service, he talked to people, and they seemed quite normal. They're actually thoughtful people. They actually had a response to his questions. And that, he marveled at that. So he went home that evening and he thought to himself, I'm going to read the scriptures and I'm going to read them in the light of that they're a lie and hopefully I will find the truth, maybe in there. But what happened, he said, was exactly the opposite. He started to realize that these were truth claims and that there was never a lie. That it built, the story built and makes sense. He began in Genesis and the story unfolded. The story, as you say, of salvation unfolded and he thought to himself, wow, where does the lie begin? Where is the myth? He never found it. And by God's grace, he became a pastor. It didn't happen that quickly but he became a Reformed pastor and he's serving every church in, in, in New Zealand. But sometimes the opposite is also the case, where pastors turn to atheists. I have two in my life, one you know of, the other one you don't. I want to speak of the one you don't know of, some of you would know of him. I grew up this, with this man and, and he became a youth pastor in Toronto. But he went to, of course, a secular university, and I think a lot of people who go to secular universities are constantly in kind of combative mode. They're all, always hearing attacks against the, the authority of the Word of God. It's, it's living and breathing authority. And he started to ask the question from a kind of a postmodern culturalistic or relativistic point of view, if, if, there, if there are no absolute truths, why do people believe that there's an absolute truth in this Word? And then he began to read what they called higher criticism, the German higher criticism of the text, which is kind of a, an evolutionistic enlightenment approach to the Bible that it begins on the premise that it's not the Word of God, and then why did it form? Well, it's a myth, it's folklore, it's a, it's a story that was fabricated. And over time, he imbibed all of these lies. And it's like dominoes. Things just started to fall down. All the structures of his faith began to fall down. And I felt like I was the guy trying to, to help him, to hold it back up, and ultimately I fell with it. Well, I didn't fall, but 
It fell through me. What surprised me, and it shouldn't surprise you, but what happened was as the structures of his faith began to fall, fell down, to fall down, he didn't believe in Genesis, he didn't believe in the creation account, he then didn't believe in the, the story of Israel, and then the incarnation, well, that's a myth, and then the cross, well, that may have been an event, but it has no meaning to me. And where, where the, last, the last domino standing was the resurrection. When that domino fell, I remember talking to him later, he said, that was the loneliest and the hardest day of my life. All of a sudden I realized that Jesus is no longer the one that brought me comfort and hope. And my heart just reeled within me because he had lost the faith. He could not hold to the claims that we hold to, that the Bible is an authoritative word of God. And that's supernatural. What is this age of suspicion? And, and I don't have time to kind of unpack all of these realities. And, and, and maybe you have time, have, have time to do that yourself. But in the age of suspicion, in the post-enlightenment age, which is what we live in, these are some of the things that, that our culture is, is defending or holding on to that pushes against Scripture. Truth is relative. And because truth is relative, that there's no absolute, and they, though they say that with an absolute sense of confidence, that it's relative, I always get, I think that's quite funny. But they argue that truth is relative, and absolutes then are oppressive. And because there are absolutes in the scripture, those become oppressive on people. So they're suspicious about that. Uh, culture has changed. Uh, biblical culture is regressive. It's, it's not improving. Biblical culture, they say, is it's regressing. It's not getting any better. And they look at sexuality or they look at various norms in Scripture and say those are regressive norms. We don't want to hold to them in this enlightened culture that we live in. Manipulation. We'll get further into this in the weeks to come, but on how the canon was formed, some argue that it was a process of power and manipulation thanks to guys like Dan Brown and Da Vinci Code. The whole idea of the edict of, of, of tolerance by Constantine, uh, the church just kind of went around that idea and said, well, in order for us to have power within the, Ro the Greco-Roman world, or at least the Roman world at that time, we need to canonize the scripture because that, that gives us power and authority. And so that's how they believe the canon was formed, and that's just manipulation. It's power to build a movement. It's, it's, it's a lie. But ultimately, I think this is where our cultural norm, especially amongst the youth in our culture, it denies my freedom. If I need to be true to myself, and myself feels expressive expressions within my sexual identity to do this or this or that, and the Bible says I should not be doing, to that, doing that, that denies my freedom, and therefore it's suspect. I'm suspicious of anything that denies my freedom, anything that doesn't allow me to be true to myself. And those are just four. I, I could go on with many more. But all of them are putting pressure on Christians and all of them putting pressure on those who hold to the, to the infallibility of the word of God as God's only word. And this is what we find now in Canada. This is how people, at least in 2013, viewed the, the Christian gospel. Just 14% read the Bible at least once a month. That's not great. That's 28% down from 28% in 1996. And this is, this is in 2013. 64% believe that all of scriptures are, are the same, basically, from all uh, religions, and you'll hear that often, whether you hold to the, the Hindu uh, scriptures or the, or the, the Koran, uh, they're all basically the same. 69% think that the Bible has irreconcilable differences. They've heard that, and they just believe it. They haven't researched it. Only 18%, and I think it's probably even less today, strongly agree that the Bible is actually the word of God. That it's a word divinely inspired by God. And that's the culture, that's the, that's the turf that we're engaging now within our present age. And that brings us to this. What is inspiration? If we believe in the inspired word of God, what is that? Well, here's a summary of what Peter and Paul talk about. God sovereignly worked upon human authors so that they wrote what he wanted them to write. We confess that this word of God did not come by the impulse of man, but that man, man moved by the Holy Spirit, 
spoke from God. So all Scripture has been breathed out. That's the Greek theopanousos, breathed out or inspired, which is the only place in Scripture that this word inspired is found, inspired by God. Or else you could say it kind of like this, the Holy Spirit formed every word appearing on the pages of the Bible in the autograph, in the original text. And at the same time, each word and phrase bears the stamp of the very real human writer living with his feet on the ground in a specific context. And that specific context, of course, spans 1,500 years as the Bible is, is being written um, in numerous different cultures and even languages. And the inherent unity with all that is an unbelievable mystery that we have this Word of God inspired by His Holy Spirit. And in so many ways, it's a faith presupposition that we hold, that we hold to the Word of God as, as the Word of God inspired by God. This is a faith statement. And in that context, because we believe this to be the Word of God, uh, we do not ultimately have to defend it. It's this picture, the Word of God is like a lion. You don't have to defend a lion. Don't try either. All you have to do is let the lion loose, and the lion will defend itself. That is true of the Word of God, even in our contemporary post-enlightenment, post-modern, secular, humanistic age. But the Bible can stand up against it. It's been doing it for 2,000 years, especially the last 250 years. It's like a lion. What we need to do is share it boldly and let the Holy Spirit do the work of witnessing that, the truth of that in people's heart. I like this quote from Amos 3, verse 7. It says, Surely the sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing his plan to his servants, the prophets. The lion has roared. Who will not fear? The sovereign Lord has spoken. Who can but prophesy? There's a comparable between the lion and God's spoken word in that text. But tonight we need to just, in the brief time that we have together, look at the, the internal evidence of the trustworthiness of the Scriptures. And this brings us to our text. Now, of course, when we talk about the Scriptures, as, as, whether it's trustworthy or not, often people will say, well, there's two ways of approaching that reality. The one is an external evidence. Is there external evidence that proves that the Word of God or the Bible is the divinely inspired Word of God? Is it true? And so when you talk about external evidence, you might say, well, does archaeological evidence corroborate with the truths of Scripture? Does archaeological evidence support this? That's one way of, of questioning uh, the, the, the trustworthiness of the Bible. And one archaeologist, I'll just share this one, Nelson Gluck, a renowned Jewish archaeologist, says, no archaeological discovery has ever controverted a biblical reference. Archaeologists all over Israel and the Middle East have come to realize that anything, anytime they find a new thing that, uh, uh, that from the ancient world in connection to the history of Israel, it corroborates, it supports the finding of what you find in the text. But of course you have other, other ways of discovering ancient writings from other writers like Tacitus, Josephus, Jewish sources. You have science, you have social science, you have philosophy, all external evidence to the Bible saying that this is true. But people are all continue to move in that realm, and I'm not going to move in that realm tonight. I'm going to move into, in the inter internal realm. There's, is there internal, internal evidence that this book, this, these scriptures are true? And there's a lot of internal evidence. Uh, more than we can discuss in the next five minutes that this word is a unity, that this word has been inspired, that this word works together, that all of this is breathed out by God. But I, I just want to focus on one reality, and that is the person of Jesus Christ. There's Jesus Christ, who is the eternal Son of God, and through whom, in fact, the, God, the Scriptures were formed, you could say. But does Jesus Christ hold to the authority and the historicity of the Scriptures, and in particular, then, to the Old Testament Scriptures? And the answer to that question is, yes, he does. And what's very interesting about Jesus is that in his life, he never had to stand up in front of a congregation like I am right now to defend the trustworthiness of the Old Testament scriptures. He never did that. 
because he didn't have to. Because it was assumed that everyone he was engaging with in Israel believed them to be the very word of God, though they missed the mark on what their intent was. So we have Jesus in the story here defending the scriptures pointing to him and inversely or indirectly defending the reality that these are authoritative, that these are very, the very words of God. And so I have four, four points on this. I'm going to with them, go through them quite quickly. Number one, Jesus states that John testified to the truth of the scriptures, and he did. Uh, verse 36, I have testimony, sorry, verse 33, you have sent to John and he has testified to the truth. Not that I accept human testimony, but I mention it that you may be saved. John was a lamp that burned and gave light and you chose for a time to enjoy his light. John testified to Christ and pointed to the Old Testament by, by saying, you know, when Jesus, for example, came to John to be baptized, Jesus, John says to Jesus, behold the... Lamb of God, who took the sin, away the sins of the world. This is not the little woolly lamb that you saw during the time of Egypt, Exodus, or Israel's Exodus out of Egypt. This is the very Lamb of God, but he's drawing a reference to the Old Testament reality that John testifies to this truth, that Jesus is fulfilling this reality. So he's testifying to the truth. And then he says, my father is also testifying to the truth. Verse 36, I have testimony weighter than that of John, John's is pretty good. For the works that the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I am doing, testify that the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me also has himself testified concerning me. He testified concerning him at his baptism. He said, Behold, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. But he also testified to his coming through Isaiah and the Incarnation. And the promises that, that would be fulfilled in him. There was this constant testifying to the person and work of Christ. And, and God says, God the Father says, now he has come. Everything written about him is true. Now he has come. My, here's proof. I'm testifying to him. He's my beloved son. Pointing to the authority of the Old Testament scriptures. Number three, Jesus knew the Jewish leaders' zeal for the scriptures, but the word was not in them. Here it is. Verse 38, it says, Nor does his word dwell in you, for you do not believe the one he sent. What's the word? The word is the scriptures. They don't dwell in them because they don't believe in the one he has sent, speaking of the Father. They didn't understand the scriptures. It's not that the scriptures were weak or lacked trustworthiness, or that they weren't um, the very word of God. That's not the problem here. The problem is that they did not believe in it. The word did not indwell them. Because he says in verse 39, you study the scriptures diligently, but you, because you think in them you will have eternal life. And all God's people say, yes, uh, you want to seek eternal life. And he says, but these are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. If these words of the Old Testament were not authoritative, Jesus could not say that. But he can say this because the words of God are true, they are authoritative, they are inspired, and because of that, all of them, all of the books, the six, the 40, how many books in the Old Testament? 49? 39, thank you. should know that. Speak about the reality of me, Jesus saying, of being the eternal Son of God, the one that was promised. And finally, Jesus proved that all Scripture is about him and then demand a response. Because the Scriptures are authoritative, and now we also believe that the New Testament Scriptures are authoritative as well, also divinely inspired, and we can talk about that in, in the future weeks, how, the, how we understand their inspiration but because of all of Scripture's being inspired, they drive us to one great reality. And that is this. That you need to know the one of whom Scripture speaks. If you do not know the one of whom Scripture speaks, the Scriptures will be held against you. See, Moses spoke of Christ 
But he says, Moses is going to accuse you. You understand, you think you know the scriptures. Moses is going to accuse you on the day of days. This is verse 45. You, you, you do not think I will accuse you before the Father. Your accuser is Moses. Like, what? On whom your hopes are set. If you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. It's not enough to know the scriptures. It's not enough to say, I, I, I believe that this is the very word of God. That's the first step. Do you believe in, him, in, in the one in whom the scripture speaks? Do you believe in Jesus Christ? That's the question. Because without Christ, you cannot have life. We study the scriptures because we want to know more about him. And he is the one, that lamb that was slaughtered on the tree. He is the one who gave his life for the ransom of many. He is the one who gave his life for you so that you could live eternally with him. Do you know him? And you have the authority of scripture to back it up, that he is true. That all you need to know about Jesus is found in his holy word. He is the author of your life. I like this quote, and finally, with, I'll end with this quote from our good old friend Keller. He says, a fully, absolutely authoritative and trustworthy word of God that you have to submit to, whether you like to or not, is not the enemy of a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It's the precondition. It's the first step in coming to know Christ, that you believe in this trustworthy word. It's not a cold and, and, and austere book of rules, this book. This book should warm your heart. You remember those two guys that walked from, um, from Jerusalem to Emmaus? Jesus steps in and, and, and begins to kind of, well, he berates them a little bit and says, well, why don't you know what's going on here? But as he explains Scripture, beginning with Moses and the prophets, pointing to himself, by the end of the walk and by the end of the conversation, and Jesus now leaves, what do they say? Were not our hearts, what? Burning within us. Why? Because this is a warm and engaging book. Because this is the book of life. It's not meant to be on your shelf, left alone between service, between Sundays. It's meant to be opened every day so that your relationship with Christ will grow, your convictions will grow, your ability to defend the gospel will grow. I'll finish with this. I had a question brought to me at, uh, where was I this afternoon? Fellowship. I had a long week, didn't get any sleep. I'm stumbling all over the place tonight. So I was in fellowship this afternoon. And I, one of the questions, so I'm preempting a question, you don't have to ask it now. One of the questions was, you know, how do we as university students stand up for the gospel, for the word of God, when we're constantly being ridiculed, berated, put down because we hold to this word of God? How, how do we stand in the, in the face of this kind of opposition? And I said two things. I said, number one, well, you can expect that to happen. It's very interesting. When Jesus says the Holy Spirit will come, and will reveal all truth to you in chapter 14 of John, so that you'll know what to write down when it comes to my word. The next chapter, in chapter 15, he says, and they will hate you. <laughs> They'll hate you just as they hated me. They'll hate you on account of me. What's he saying? This, this word will not bring you lots of friends and influence a lot of people in your social, secular connections. This word will actually maybe create a divide. Be prepared for that. It's not the problem with the word of God. It's the problem with culture that does not want to submit to it. And do not see it as warm and encouraging and loving. But the second thing I said to this person is this. That every single time Jesus was attacked, whether by the devil or by others, it, even in the worst of conditions on the cross, he spoke the word of God. He bled scripture. And that was his defense. 
against all the evil pressed up against him, even in the wilderness. So your greatest defense in an age of suspicion is for you to be enthralled with the Word, but also to be engulfed in the Word, to be suffused by the Word, to be imbibed by the Word. I'm just finding words now. To be full of the Word of God. You can read all the external evidence. You can read all the people who are against us, the, the, the people who, who speak detractors against the Word. You can read all about that. But are you reading the Bible so that when people are asking questions, you have a defense for the faith? Some have said, I'll, the only book that you need is the Word of God. And it's true. It can stand on its own. It stood on its own for 2,000 years. You're not going to make it stand any better than what it can do on its own. Know it well. Defend it boldly. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this Word. We thank you, Lord, that it's powerful unto salvation. We thank you that the Word points to Christ. Lord, if we know the word but we don't know Christ, we are to be pitied of all people. We pray, O oh God, that when we read the word, both the Old and New Testament, that we will see Christ on the pages of Scripture. That we'll be blown away by your love and by your compassion towards us and by your grace. Oh, we thank you so much for this word. What a mystery, what a miracle that we stand on the other side of its formation, that we stand on the other side of all the years that it took to, to create this awesome book. And we get to enjoy it. And yet, Lord, we know that there are 6,500 languages in this world, and the Bible in part or in whole has been only translated into 3,000 of those languages. We have 50,000 different translations in English it seems. Lord, continue to send out Bible translators into all the world so that they will continue to translate this word into the heart languages of cultures and people groups all over this world so that they too will know the truth and be set free because your word is life. And may that life live within us, we pray.